Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. The major arcana of the tarot is filled with timeless images of mysterious origin, each numbered and offering a plethora of interpretations for the purpose of divination. The Fool is a notable outlier of these 22 cards, as it holds the number zero or no number at all. Its placement in the order of these cards has been debated in a long history of tarot, which has changed its interpretive value. Various occultists have placed the Fool between the 20th and 21st cards, Judgment and the World, respectively, or at the very end, while more modern decks place the card at the very beginning, preceding the Magician. While the meaning of the card can be, and often is, interpreted simply as a caution to the querent, its historical ambiguity and its placement should serve as a reminder that the Fool, like the rest of the cards, may not be as simple to read as it might appear. It's easy to read the Fool as a warning. A young man is pictured in the popular Ryder Waite Smith deck as being one step away from falling headlong over a cliffside with a small dog at his heels. His head in the clouds, as it were, he seems oblivious to the danger. To be called a fool, or described as foolish, can hardly be interpreted as a compliment. Thus, it's tempting to associate the fool with folly, over-exuberance, and lack of awareness with little or no other context. The fool, however, also has his admirable qualities. He is pure of spirit and has a lot of heart. He's adventurous and he's willing to trust his intuition. An innocent tumble from a cliff could also be interpreted as a leap of faith. Moreover, the fool can symbolize simply stepping into the unknown. A popular idea among readers of the tarot, in fact, is that of the fool's journey through the major arcana. In this context, each card can be read in order as a linear progression through life, as the Fool meets the Magician, the High Priestess, and so on. In this sense, each of us is a Fool, or at least begins as one, and the rest of the cards follow a path that constitutes the journey of our individual lives. We all play the Fool at some point, and at any moment when we find ourselves trusting our gut instincts and beginning a new venture, we become the Fool as we plot our way through it. While caution and self-awareness are valuable in these cases, the intuitive decisions made in our lives that feel right are powerful turning points, which can lead to ruin or fortune. What may seem to be a foolish decision can be, and often is, a life-changing one. In this sense, the fool in each of us is what prompts us to avoid becoming victims of our present circumstances. The Fool is a challenge to fate itself. In the spirit of foolishness and fate-defying actions, a comparison of two historical kooks who took similar leaps into the unknown might help to illustrate how the twists and turns of such decision-making might play out. Submitted for your appreciation, here are the stories of Emperor Norton I and Lord Timothy Dexter. Timothy Dexter was born in Malden, Massachusetts in 1743. He was certainly not a lord, but he dreamed of being among those in the high society of Boston at the time. His ascent to wealth can in large part be ascribed to dumb luck. Saving money he earned in his youth, bolstered by a dowry through a marriage to an older unwed daughter of a farmer, he moved to Newburyport and opened a shop selling gloves and mittens. In a move that seemed absurd at the time, he traded his tidy savings of gold and silver for continental currency, still new at the time. After the American Revolution, Alexander Hamilton's reforms to the banking and financial systems meant that Dexter became a millionaire for his seemingly foolish investment. 
he would go on to claim that he had been guided in a dream to make this decision, as well as later gambits that seemed very odd but only profited him. He dubbed himself Lord Timothy Dexter and proceeded to be an embarrassing bane to the wealthy community members in Newburyport. He preferred eccentric clothing, including a wide-brimmed hat that was several times too large for his head. He could be seen walking with a gold cane, accompanied by a small, hairless dog named Pepper. He tried to claim himself the King of Chester, New Hampshire, after buying property there, but it didn't stick, and he had to settle for his fake lordship, and his proclamation that he was the first in the East and first in the West and greatest philosopher in the world. His business moves were always ridiculous, but in spite of it, they only ever increased his wealth. He chartered merchant ships to send hundreds of cats, cases of mittens, and bed-warming pans to the plantations in the Caribbean. The mittens were sold to a passing ship, heading to the Baltic Sea, and the plantation owners were happy to buy the cats as a means of rat control for their storehouses. The bed-warming pans sold at a profit as well, being useful as ladles and strainers for vats of molasses. Eager to see Lord Dexter fail, other businessmen conspired to suggest to him that he ought to send shipments of coal to Newcastle, England, a town well known for coal mining. So absurd was this proposal, the idiom sending coals to Newcastle had been a phrase meaning a pointless and foolish action. Dexter's shipment just happened to arrive as a strike from the miners was underway, and he still made a tidy profit from what should have been a terrible business move. His mansion on High Street became a local eyesore as he decorated the property with wooden statues which stood as grotesque interpretations of historical figures and animals. He wrote a book called A Pickle for the Knowing Ones, or Plain Truths in a Homespun Dress, which contained his alleged philosophy. It was also written in his own form of English, with inconsistent spelling and no punctuation at all. It sold out and went into further editions, and in these later editions he added a few pages of various punctuation marks that the reader may pepper and salt it as they please throughout the text. The disdain from his neighbors and his wife was obvious, but he had a troop of hangers-on who were happy to encourage his ridiculousness for a chance at his money. In order to prove loyalty from those around him, he faked his death and observed his funeral from his house. When he eventually did die, it was at the age of 63. The Newbury Port nut attracted thousands to his real funeral, and it's still remembered for his eccentricities. Joshua Abraham Norton was born 13 years later in London, although the city was fated to be associated with San Francisco. He was initially attracted to the city during the gold rush, but decided money was better made through mercantile trade in the city. He did well, until greed got the better of him. In an attempt to corner the market on rice, he bought every shipment that came into the city and charged a premium. When ships laden with rice arrived from South America, the bottom fell out, and he was ruined. A few years later, he would walk into the offices of the San Francisco Bulletin and solemnly tell the editors, I am the Emperor of the United States. The amused editor, who likely was in the midst of a slow news day, agreed to run a front-page article with Norton's proclamation. Citizens of San Francisco were amused as well, and fell in love with this shabby character who would quickly proclaim that he had abolished Congress and that he had decided he was also the protector of Mexico. His reputation grew, and he would hold court in a rooming house or be seen walking around town in his tattered military uniform. He is often portrayed as being accompanied by stray dogs, namely the celebrity strays Boomer and Lazarus, although it seems this relationship was apocryphal. He issued his own currency, which was largely honored. He implemented taxes that were paid by the amused subjects of his empire and would ride the rails for free. So beloved was the emperor that a century after his claim to the title, he would be honored as a saint in the pseudo-religion of Discordianism, with co-founder Greg Hill writing, Everybody understands Mickey Mouse, few understand Herman Hesse, hardly anybody understands Einstein, and nobody understands Emperor Norton. When Norton I collapsed on a street corner and died in 1880, 
His funeral lasted two days and was attended by 10,000 people. As an emperor, he was held as a beneficent one. His obituary said that he killed nobody, robbed nobody, and deprived nobody of his country, which is more than could be said for most fellows in his trade. The similarities between the two men are obvious. Each claimed a title of nobility. Each made absurd decisions that forever cemented their associations with their respective cities, and each had a flair for eccentric clothing and are depicted accompanied by dogs. It's interesting to see that while Dexter attained wealth, he lacked the respect of his community, while Norton was destitute but widely loved and respected. The association with dogs is also curious, considering that the fool depicts a small dog at the heels of the title character. This harkens back to the Greek philosopher Diogenes, the original cynic who eschewed social norms and spent his life looking for an honest man, living in abject poverty among the stray dogs. It is more than fitting for Norton I to be sainted by the Discordians, as Diogenes and others exemplify the concept of the holy fool, those subversive characters who are able to enact social changes through profoundly eccentric behavior. Various cultures have examples of such figures who act absurdly to reflect the absurdity of the society they have abandoned back at it. While Dexter's inscrutable attempts at philosophy amounted to little more than complaining about his treatment by those around him, his garish and opulent excesses which so offended the elites of Newburyport make a salient, albeit likely unintentional, comment about greed and excess. Norton used his platform as a notable kook to advance progressive social ideas, such as civil rights for African Americans following the Civil War. Foolishness can be a powerful thing and can lead to profound changes in one's own life as well as effects throughout society at large and even down through the ages. The fool and its trickster nature within the top 22 cards of the tarot deck should ever be a reminder that fate, along with its many and varied weird pathways, need not hem us in with cliffsides or nipping hounds at our heels. The fool is a bridge builder, and summoning that energy from your own gut can sometimes be just the thing to break you from the bounds of a liminal rut. Short of taking a leap of faith, it at least behooves us all to get into the open air and face what's coming with a smile. After all, it's the fool's world. We just live in it. In the world of Fortiana, there are two types of people, those focused on the forest and those focused on the trees. Whether your time is devoted to determining the source behind humanity's relationship with the other or the study of individual instances of para-weird phenomena, it's undeniable that the forest contains a few sequoias that cannot be ignored. The massive, seemingly monolithic figures have set bars, defined boundaries, and in some cases literally laid the foundation of this beautiful and fascinating field that we all find ourselves immersed in. And it all began with the man who quite literally defined what it is that we're doing here. Jordan Heath talks about Charles Fort. Charles Fort was a researcher and writer of anomalous phenomena, a satirist, and a skeptic. He had the ability to entertain the reader by making the normal appear abnormal, and conversely, the abnormal appear normal. His writing style has been described as being a distinctive blend of mocking humor with penetrating insight and calculated outrageousness. Fort was self-educated. He spent an enormous amount of time in the New York City Library where he would read scientific journals, popular science magazines, and other scientific literature. This dedicated study provided him with a thorough knowledge of what was going on in the world in general. He was a maker and keeper of copious notes, many of which survive to this day. He began his writing career as a novelist, but initially struggled with getting any of his ten books published. Most agree that this is due to his mocking writing style, which would not come into style for another thirty years or so. Eventually, one of his novels, The Outcast Manufacturers, was published in 1906. The book received good reviews, but was commercially unsuccessful. In 1916, an inheritance from an uncle allowed Fort to quit his various day jobs 
and become a full-time researcher and writer. He then began to write two books and entitled them Theory X and Theory Y. Theory X dealt with the notion that Martians were controlling events on Earth. The Theory Y book dealt with a mysterious and sinister civilization at the South Pole. The books caught the attention of Theodore Dreiser, also a writer, and he assisted Fort in an attempt to have the books published. These books were not merely ignored by publishers. Ford received several responses that, in his opinion, openly mocked the premises of the books. A disheartened Fort burned the two manuscripts, not being aware that he would eventually become famous and the interest in his destroyed books would have been significant. Thankfully, Fort was able to dig deep and summon a remarkable determination that would eventually see him through. He resumed his studies and his writing and in 1919 completed his next book, The Book of the Damned. The title referred to the damned data Fort collected, data for which science could not account, and the data was thus rejected or ignored. Theodore Dreiser again helped Fort to get the book published, and it became relatively successful. It would go on to be reissued several times. The most recent reissue was in 1999 through Prometheus Books of Buffalo, New York. Fort went on to publish several other books, including New Lands, first published in 1923, and also reissued several times by Ace Books Low, first issued in 1931, and Wild Talents, first published in 1932. In 1998, Dover Publications released a collection of his works titled Complete Books of Charles Fort. Charles Fort was born in Albany, New York, on August 6, 1874. He was of Dutch ancestry and had two younger brothers. Fort's father was, by all accounts, a harsh parent, as related by Fort in his unpublished autobiography. When he was 18, following high school, determined to see the world, he traveled through the western United States, Great Britain, and finally South Africa. Accounts suggest that it was there that he became seriously ill with what is assumed to have been malaria. He returned home immediately, where he was nursed back to health by his father's maid, Anna Filing. Little did he know that this bit of misfortune would have a life-altering silver lining. He developed a relationship with Anna, and in 1896, the two were married. The two eventually settled in the Bronx, New York. Fort made ends meet by doing odd jobs, but his focus, as always, was on his studies. He spent nights and off time lost in the stacks of the New York Public Library or buried in books on loan. For a period of two years, from 1924 to 1926, he and his wife Anna moved to London, England. Fort had set his sights on the files of the British Museum, and access to the vast archive expanded his knowledge base in a way that seems to have significantly improved his writing. However, this privilege was not the most important aspect of his time in England. Although Fort was generally considered to be a loner, while living in the UK, he slowly developed a circle of friends in the writing community. It is through them that he initially encountered Theodore Dreiser, the man who would eventually help him to have his later work published. Fort was known as a witty individual, a character trait that clearly comes out in his writing. In his later years, Fort suffered from poor health and failing eyesight. He also became aware that his writings had developed a cult-like following. He did nothing to encourage it. While the term Fortian is often associated with wild theories and New Age beliefs, it's important to remember that Charles Fort was a real skeptic. He was equally skeptical of the scientific community and the spiritualism movement. Despite his no-nonsense approach to his studies, the cult-like following still exists today. If you look closely enough, you'll find his name everywhere. The Fortean Society, the Fortean Journal, Fortean Times Magazine, and the Charles Fort Institute. His life and his times. In 1932, when Fort was only in his late fifties, his health deteriorated. He distrusted doctors and refused to seek help for his worsening health. During this time, he was in the process of completing his manuscript entitled Wild Times. He collapsed on May 3, 1932. He was rushed to Royal Hospital in the Bronx. His publisher rushed to the hospital to show Fort an advanced copy of his latest manuscript, Wild Times. Later that day, Fort passed away. Most agreed that he suffered from leukemia. 
He was interred in his family's plot in Albany, New York. He had accumulated 60,000 handwritten notes. After his death, the notes were donated to the New York Public Library, the place where he had done most of his reading, self-education, and research, his home away from home. Often in this field, we hear the phrase, be skeptical, but don't be a skeptic. This sentiment is a distilling of a truly Fordian concept. Ford believed that everything should be questioned. According to him, no conventional wisdom should be accepted on its face. While the way he truly lived his concept sounds exhausting, it's a vital through line for those of us involved in Fordian research to maintain. We owe so much to Charles Fort and the work that he did. Know his life. Know his work. You both deserve it. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. Paranormality Magazine often has a section in their issues called Glitch in the Matrix. Here's one called Time Loop. Something happened a few years back that I can't shake, and I'd really love some kind of explanation as to what the hell happened, as it has played on my mind ever since. Let me just clarify before I start, I'm completely sound of mind. I just want some closure, I guess. So here it goes. I've always been into the paranormal as a kid. I was completely fascinated by it and have found over the years the more open to it you are, the more downright bizarre some of the stuff you experience is. This tops my list of weird experiences. This happened about seven years ago. My sister came to my flat one night after work, she finished work at 17.30, to spend a bit of time with me, as we had both been working like crazy and hadn't had the time to catch up. It was just the two of us, and she suggested having a game of cards with our coffees, something we've always done since kids. It's a favorite pastime in our house. Once I'd gotten the cards out and started shuffling them, she asked me to look at the time on my phone, as she had to work the next morning at 7 a.m. and needed to be home at a reasonable time. She'd lost her phone on a night out a few days previous. I told her it was 18.10 p.m. in the evening. She replied, okay, well, I'll have to be getting off around 20.45 p.m. to get my uniform washed and dried, so keep an eye on the time for me. I agreed, and we started playing a bit of rummy to start with. Now, we weren't drinking alcohol or taking any drugs. We were just having a relaxed game of cards, chatting about guys and work, the usual stuff, I suppose. Everything was normal. We played cards for what felt like two hours easy. I mean, you can't mistake that length of time when you have had about 16 to 18 hands of rummy and were in the early stages of playing a game of poker having got bored of the other game. Out of nowhere, I remember having the weirdest feeling come over me like the light in the room dimmed, and I distinctly felt an electrical crackle start in the bottom of my spine and shoot all the way up to my skull. I physically jolted upright, the sensation was so intense. I looked at her, and she was looking at me all wide-eyed and silent like she knew something was up. I blurted out, something's wrong, really very wrong. Without blinking or reacting in any other way, she just says to me, look at the time which I thought was the weirdest response. I picked up my phone, looked at the time. A mixture of shock and dread creeps over me. That can't be right. It's not possible, I mumbled out loud. 
My phone must have glitched out or something. Getting up to turn the telly on to see what the time is on there, she's looking at me like, what the hell is going on? What is it? What's the time? She asks me again. I just repeat that it can't be right, and as I switch the telly on, the time flashes up in the corner of the screen. It's at 1829. She sees it and is now just as freaked out as I am. That can't be right. Did your phone say the time? I showed her the screen. I pull out a laptop to check the time and even got a watch out of my drawer to see if they all matched, and sure enough, they did. There was no possible way that we had been sat playing cards for just 20 minutes. I asked her how long she thought we had been sat there for, and she said a couple of hours, like myself. We just sat there in a bit of a fog like what on earth had just happened. We tried to discuss it, but we couldn't make any sense of it. To be honest, it felt uncomfortable. Even to this day, to talk about it, it doesn't feel right. She breaks the silence with a joke, something like, oh well, at least I have another couple of hours to chill with you. We just tried to forget about it. Paranormality Magazine's Nicole Whitney has a series called Dreaming About – What Does It Mean?, and in the April 2023 issue, she talked about owls – dreaming about owls. It can have various meanings depending on the context of the dream. Generally, it is said the dreaming of an owl symbolizes wisdom, transition, and wealth. To dream of an owl watching you can signify that the choices you make in life will determine your future success or failure. Owls also represent vigilance and can indicate that you need to pay attention to the warning signs in your life or situation. Alternatively, dreaming of an owl can also mean that you're being too critical or judgmental of a situation. The symbol of an owl appearing in a dream may tell you to be less judgmental and open up to new ideas and perspectives. Owls may also represent the need for you to look inward at yourself, your emotions, and your inner strength. When an owl appears in a dream, it may be trying to tell you something about yourself that you need to pay attention to. In some cases, dreaming of an owl can indicate that you are now entering a period of transition or change in your life. Owls are also a sign of knowledge, so dreaming about an owl may signify that you need to learn something or gain more understanding on a particular topic or situation. Additionally, owls are a sign of wealth and abundance, so dreaming of an owl could be indicating that financial success is coming your way. Whatever the context of your dream, it is important to take note of any symbols and feelings associated with the owl in order to interpret its true meaning. Paying attention to the details of your dream and trusting your intuition is the best way to understand its message. Imagine you have a curiosity for the paranormal. Scratch that. If you're listening to this, you don't have to imagine. So imagine you want to go investigate a paranormal location with a couple of friends. But the cost of doing a private investigation is too much. However, you see this news article about a company that does public investigations at the exact location you want to investigate. You excitedly reserve the tickets for you and your friends by paying the deposit and you patiently wait until October for your investigation. But then you see a TikTok that the company has gone bankrupt and closed. No emails, no phone calls, absolutely no communication letting you know that this has happened. Now you're left scrambling to get your money back and trying to get answers as to why this happened. Paranormality Magazine's Cody Sharp talks about when ghost hunt companies leave you ghosted. This is the reality for Courtney from North Carolina who had paid Ghost Hunts USA a deposit for herself and her friends to explore the battleship North Carolina. She'd seen an article in the newspaper about Ghost Hunts USA and visited their website. Seeing that it was pretty legit, she thought, okay, cool. She ordered three tickets for herself and her two friends for the October investigation using her Capital One credit card. She received the confirmation emails and went online to fill out all the waivers that are required. She thought that they would reach out when it was closer to the time of the event to confirm everything. But then, a couple weeks later, she happened to be scrolling TikTok and happened 
to see BJ, the web guy from the Unrefined podcast, discussing Ghost Hunt USA going out of business. Courtney thought this was really weird because she did not get any notification that the event was canceled. She went to Ghost Hunt USA's Facebook page to see that the following post was made, dated April 5th. Quote, After nine years of everything paranormal, we have made the tough decision to close Ghost Hunts USA effective immediately. The last few months have been very challenging, and we have reached a point where the business cannot continue in its current state. We would like to thank thousands of you who have become friends over the years and passionately supported our business. Next steps, all future events are canceled immediately. If you have a ticket to a future event, please contact your credit card company or bank and request a refund through their chargeback process. Similarly, if you are awaiting a refund for a canceled event or have reached out to request a refund for an event you cannot attend, please contact your credit card company or bank for further assistance. Today is also the last day for all of our team members who we would like to thank for their commitment and dedication to making our events the best possible experience they can be for our guests. Thank you from all of us at Ghost Hunts USA for the last nine years." Unquote. Courtney said that she left a Facebook post that went unanswered and sent an email to Ghost Hunts USA that also went unanswered. Courtney's only other option was to file a dispute with Capital One, and she thought, oh well, the company went out of business and I was unable to receive my purchase, so this should be pretty straightforward. Courtney told me that they initially gave her the money back, but about a month later they came back with a document that said that her dispute was denied and that she received her services and that they were in good condition. That was the statement from Ghost Hunts USA in response to Courtney's dispute. Now, this isn't some sort of fluke. If you go on to Ghost Hunts USA group on Facebook, you will see multiple people stating the same story. Their disputes were denied because they, quote, received their services and that they were in good condition, unquote. Courtney felt confused because clearly she did not receive her services in good condition. Her concern turned towards her bank as to why nobody questioned this response from Ghost Hunts USA. Courtney said credit card companies don't really pay attention, I guess. She decided to follow up with a secondary dispute with her credit card company. Now, at this point in the interview, she had not yet named Capital One, but I flat out asked her what the name of the company was so I could reach out to their PR team about this story. If you have a credit card and you're supposed to have fraud protection, then in my opinion that company should honor it. So Capital One said she needed to provide all this documentation to process this claim and send it to them in the mail. Courtney told me that is exactly what she did. She printed out the email that said, we went out of business and that you need to get your money back from your credit card company. She printed out the receipt for the event, which showed the October 2023 date on it. She provided all the documentation necessary and included a complete one-page letter explaining everything. Then one day she received a letter in her account messages that said, you didn't provide us with all the documentation that we needed, but not specifying what she didn't provide, and that the matter is closed. Basically, they said she had no more chances to reach out on this matter. Instead of just sitting there, accepting defeat, Courtney was like, well, that's not going to work for me to just sit on that. She told me that she is lucky enough that she's okay financially, this isn't going to break her budget, but she imagines a lot of other people that have paid full price for these tickets and they are not going to get their money back, that it's got to hurt. We continued to talk about the situation and how Ghost Hunts USA has had a shady history of allegedly not paying locations, allegedly not paying employees, and that what they are allegedly doing amounts to wire fraud and credit card fraud. After the interview, I went straight away to contacting Capital One's media relations department to get their comment on why they were not protecting their credit card members. Within an hour of me sending an email to their credit card media relations person, I received an email from someone at Capital One asking for Courtney's phone number so that someone in their corporate escalations team could reach out to her. I messaged Courtney, and I was able to get her phone number forwarded to Capital One. And then we waited. I got a response back from Capital One three days later from Annie on the corporate communications team with the following response. Hi, Cody. I'm reaching out to you from Capital One's corporate communications team. Katie is out of the office today, so I wanted to circle back with you. 
I'm happy to let you know that we have resolved this issue as desired by the customer. Courtney will be getting a notification in the mail in the next five to seven business days in regards to the resolution. Best, Annie. This is a promising step. However, it shouldn't take someone from the media to step in and help people out. That's why I'm encouraging anyone that is a victim of Ghost Hunts USA to start filing police reports and complaints with their state's attorney general's office to hopefully get some recourse. Locations and customers were not the only ones losing money, so were employees of Ghost Hunts USA. I spoke to a former employee that wanted to remain anonymous as they fear there will be retaliation for speaking out. They told me that last summer was when they suspected that something was going on behind the scenes. People were getting fired, and they were all overworked. Ghost Hunts USA wasn't keeping their word, and employees were being sent to locations over eight hours from home. Schedules for the week were not being done until the last minute. The hotels that they were sent to were disgusting, and the cheapest they could find. Most of the employees were not getting paid their hourly wages or their gas reimbursements. Ghost Hunts USA would also cancel on locations last minute, literally on the day of these investigations. Several locations actually started to ask Ghost Hunts USA tour guides why they weren't getting paid money. Ghost Hunts USA allegedly blamed it on their payroll company, but it was a constant thing where employees and locations were not getting paid. Eventually, locations started dropping Ghost Hunts USA because of not getting paid, and Ghost Hunts USA tried to get employees to sign non-disclosure agreements and non-compete clauses. I've reached out to Andrew Spitz, the owner of Ghost Hunts USA, via phone and text numerous times for comment. I was sent to voicemail, and my texts for comment have been left unanswered. Like the paranormal, this leaves me, unfortunately, with more questions than answers. What happened to the money that customers paid? Only time can answer this question, and hopefully law enforcement and the courts can get the answers and help get the money back for the victims of Ghost Hunts USA. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine. <laughs>